Hi, good morning. Welcome to Hope and Anchor Church. I'm glad that you're here today. Uh, I'm thankful for the sunshine. I'm thankful for a day that's not going to be minus 10 degrees. I'm thankful for the warmth of fellowship. I think we'll all be thankful for the warmth of anything in this coming week. Have you seen the forecast? Yeah. Cripes are mighty. It's going to be pretty chilly, so be sure and bring those dogs in. Uh, keep those faucets dripping. <laughs> it's going to be a cold one. So I've already turned on the heat lamp for the chickens at our house. So we're all set, I hope. So anyway, I'm glad you're here today that we're, uh, we've come to worship King Jesus. And uh, regardless of how things have gone in, in your, your personal life, regardless of how things have gone in our world, regardless of the forecast, uh, Jesus is on the throne. And we have invitation. We have God's welcome to come and to glorify him through, through scripture, through song, through um, fellowship, and through prayer. And I'm glad that we get to do that together. I'm glad that we get to be a local expression of the kingdom. That's you and me. That's what God has called us to do. Um, at Hope and Anchor Church, we will glorify God and make disciples by leveraging our diverse giftings and experiences, our hospitality, and our community connections in a context of generational trauma and poverty, wariness of the church, and rejection of truth because we have a passion for creativity, for the pursuit of truth, and care for the alienated and overlooked. This helps answer those questions. Why us? Why here? And why now? Uh, we view the giving of tithes and offerings as an intimate expression of faith and worship, so uh, we want to be sure and offer plenty of ways for you to worship in that way. So there's baskets in the room, there's an iPad you can give online or through Planet <coughs> Center, but uh, we want to be uh, uh, a worshiping people that worship in all sorts of different ways, all those ways that God has invited us to do so. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and today we light the candle of peace. And uh, I've asked Christy to come and do our scripture reading and light our candle. So if you'll please stand. Uh, the scripture reading today is from Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. O oh God, we light the fourth candle of Advent. We hear your angel, Gabriel, and witness the faith of Mary. Fill us with your grace and light. We recall the times we have struggled, but said yes. We know times when God has filled us in our world with blessing. We remember times of great joy when, although it may have been in struggle, God has filled us with hope, love, and peace. Mary was a young, strong, and faithful woman. Even though her life was not easy, she heard God's voice and said yes. Her song was a prayer that would uplift those who were downtrodden. Her lyrics shattered the proud and called the world to change. She would bear within her the promised child, Jesus, the light of the world. This Advent, we respond to God's beckoning to us as well. Shine on us, O God of justice. Guide our path through gloom of night. Bear within us wisdom's glory. Come to us, O Christ the light. Revealing God, visit us and fill us with your spirit. Bring your good news to life within us. Give us courage to carry your light 
into the injustices and shadows of this world. Amen. Let's stay standing and worship God again. Oh Lord my God
truly great this morning, and we thank you so much just for the opportunity to stand and sing or sit and sing and just worship with our hearts, Lord. Pray that you would just be here and bless those who have maybe never reached out to you, God, and, and felt the love of your fatherly spirit, Lord. We thank you so much for the love you have in our lives, and we thank you so much, Lord, for your son, Jesus, in our life. And so we celebrate him this morning, Lord. We celebrate you, Jesus. Thank you so much. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth.
you so much, Lord, for your grace in our lives. God, we thank you so much for every single individual here that has been through their own thing, Lord. We've all had struggles, and we all have overcome them through you, God. And I pray that through those experiences, that not only could we help those around us, but you could help us to look forward to it in an eternity, that we are not where we were, Lord. But God, you have a special place for each one of us. And we thank you so much for that, God. And bless your name this morning. All right, good morning once again. Welcome to Hope and Anchor Church. Uh, today, my friends, we are continuing in our Rock of Ages series, our learning, learning adventure with the Apostle Peter. Uh, we've been, uh, this is week number 10, actually. So for 10 weeks, well, nine before now, nine weeks, we've been walking with the Apostle Peter. The first eight weeks, we got to know him a little bit. We got to uh, see some of his formative uh, experiences, those shaping uh, times with the Lord, uh, those times of growth, those times of challenge, those times when he felt like a big failure, and yet Jesus welcomed him back. Uh, what's been really good for me in this is as we've seen Peter in action with Jesus, I've seen a lot of parallels in my own life, and I think maybe you have too, that it's like, hey, hey, if Jesus could welcome Peter to himself, could use Peter and could uh, forgive and redeem Peter and then send him out and establish him uh, in God's work in the world, maybe he could do that with me too. Maybe he could do that with you too. How great is that? I hope that we all have kind of a building sense of anticipation and eagerness to discover more and more about that which God has called us to do, that which Jesus is saying to us, follow me and is leading us into during the days we've been given. Uh, during this lifetime. So today is week number 10, like I said, and today my message is called The Living Room. Uh, in your house, uh, it's possible, quite possible actually, that you have a favorite room. Think about your house. Where is it that you say, yeah, that place is my favorite part? Conversely, maybe there's a place in your house that you're like, that place is my least favorite part the laundry room or whatever it is, wherever you like. Uh, I try to avoid that spot. But in your house, there's, there's probably a favorite room, a room where you prefer to spend your time, a, a room where you like to relax, where you like to enjoy company, where you sit to read and maybe watch Netflix. Uh, for mothers of small children, uh, the favorite room is usually the bathroom. Why? Because uh, it becomes a sanctuary. It may be with small children. It's that one room that has a door that locks where you can have some privacy, some solace, a bit of respite, and maybe a, a recapturing of a sense of sanity, the bathroom. Many times when we were younger, my wife and I and had small children, I would find my wife uh, in the bathroom sanctuary, <laughs> sipping her coffee, uh, reading her book, uh, and repeating strange self-care mantras like, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. I have a life. I have friends. This won't last forever, and these small creatures, they will not conquer me. <laughs> Things like that, along those lines, right? You remember those days? All right, good times. Uh, for many fathers, uh, the patio, the back porch, or the garage, maybe that favorite space, that place where you feel most at home. Uh, maybe it's when you're grilling or, or working with your hands. Uh, for teenagers, perhaps it's uh, your bedroom, lying on your bed, listening to music, watching TikTok or cat videos, taking pictures of yourself, you know, whatever teenagers do in their bedroom. Wherever it is, there's likely a space in your home where you prefer to be. All things being equal, it's the place toward which you gravitate. Uh, in your best moments at home, this is where you are found. For me, uh, in my house, it's the living room. It's the living room where the, where the morning sun uh, shines in the bay windows because they face to the east. It's where our books live. It's where our Christmas happens. I love the living room. If friends come over, if, if guests are at our house, uh, it's where we sit and it's where we talk. It's where our dogs get under our feet and it's where the kids run around and play. The living room. I like the living room. There's something sacred 
There's something special about a space in the home that is called the room for living. The room for living, where life is intended to happen, where life is intended to take shape. The living room. What happens in your living room? I've been to several of your homes, and I think about how warm and inviting some of your homes are, and it's always the living room. That's the best spot, and I hope it's that way for you. Now, why am I talking about living rooms? Why am I talking about spaces in our homes? Well, here's the thing. There's a real sense in which God himself is inviting us into his living room. Like, God wants that intimate space to be shared with us. God is inviting us into his living room when we come to faith in Jesus. When we are reconciled to his family, we find ourselves welcome in his living room. In becoming a Christ follower, yes, our sins are forgiven and we are saved from death, but we're also welcomed into a new life. As the Westminster Shorter Catechism describes it, we enter into a life in which we seek to glorify God and what? Enjoy him forever. You ever heard that part of the catechism? The chief end of man is to glorify God. Well, we hear a lot about that in church, right? But that second part, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. In my mind, friends, that paints a picture of sitting in a living room, walking in the woods, sitting on the, on the dock at the lake and just enjoying time with our maker, being exactly where, how, and who God has made us to be, enjoying him forever. This understanding, it undergirds and it, it sustains everything we read in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, where the writers affirm and celebrate this new, real, and living reality we have in Jesus Christ. The opening verses of the Apostle Peter's first letter are no exception. Here again, we find it resonating, the theme repeated in the Scriptures. Here we find a jubilant and strange interplay of theology, of praise, identification, and sobering reality. Peter wants his readers, that's in, that includes us, Peter wants his readers to understand something right from the start. Peter wants us all to know that through faith in Jesus Christ, we are entering into intimate fellowship with God we are, we are settling right into his favorite space. That space, which we're calling God's living room, if you will, it has certain dimensions. Now, anytime we're talking about space, as an aside here, we know that there are at least three dimensions to any space. What are those three dimensions? Someone help me out. Length, width, height, or you could say width, height, or, and depth, right? The fourth dimension is time, right? Well, we're not talking about that today. Huh. Width, height, and depth. The space, God's living room, uh, it has certain dimensions. Width, height, and depth, which inform our experience, our understanding, and our identity. Here we find, one, that we are chosen by God. Two, we are given a new life. And three, we possess a faith which shines brightly, especially when we what? Suffer. Of all I talk about today, this is going to be that one difficult and strange part of what Peter presents here. Yes, we are chosen by God. Yes, we are given new life. And yes, we now possess a faith, and that faith shines most brightly when we suffer. When we suffer, and this will sound strange to our insulated, western, comfortable ears, but the, the first century audience to which Peter was writing, they understood it at a gut level. They were living in this reality every single day. Your faith shines most brightly when you suffer. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. This is where we were last week. And we're going to cover the same verses, and we're going to get a running start at the beginning nine verses of chapter 1 in 1 Peter. So uh, follow along as I read. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. 
I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. There's a lot said there. There's a lot to be heard in that passage and a lot to be considered. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces, provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I'll point out that that's the first, this is the first week I've said Cappadocia correctly, which I think some of you will appreciate. Anyway. Uh, let's see. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. So last week, we jumped into Peter's first letter. Uh, we examined its, its context, its occasion, why it was written, and to whom it was written. We, we talked about the audience, but we also discovered encouragement. Peter through Silas's pen, he hit the ground running. He didn't waste a lot of time. He wanted us to grasp right away, right up front, you are chosen by God. You're chosen by God. You have been sanctified and you've been cleansed in Jesus. In his first paragraph, Peter covers a lot of ground identifying first his, uh, his authority as an apostle, one who had seen the incarnate Christ, Christ in the flesh, had walked with him, talked with him, uh, participated in ministry with him. He established his authority as an apostle. He tells why he is writing. He describes to whom he is writing. And he assures his readers that he is praying for them. And he doesn't uh, faff around, is the word. Faff. He doesn't faff around. He gets right to the point. What was the other word? He doesn't gad around either. Yeah, my wife and I are having this conversation this week. Uh, he gets right to the point, and I'm thankful for that. But he doesn't omit the fact that, hey, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God will give you more and more grace and peace. His opening greetings state the premise and the structure that will permeate and shape structure the whole letter. From here forward. Additionally, he sketches out the first dimension here in those first two verses of God's living room. He sketches out the width of the space into which we have been invited through faith in Jesus Christ. Here comes N.T. Wright to help us out. N.T. Wright helps frame our thinking here. He says, the opening three paragraphs of Peter's first letter, which we take here all together, set out the width, the height, and the depth within which everything that follows will take place. The first nine verses are quite a mouthful and a mindful, but it's worth seeing them all together as the framework for the more specific things Peter has in mind to say as the letter develops. To begin with, the width of the building, verses one and two, this is what Christians are. Chosen, set aside, sanctified for obedience, sprinkled with the Messiah's blood. Already we have much to ponder. 
Peter doesn't address these people in terms of their ancestry, their moral background, their social status, their wealth, or poverty. All those things are part of the old building, and he is sketching out the new one. It is easy to forget our basic identity as Christians, and it is therefore important to be reminded of it on a regular basis. So, in describing the width of God's living room, we learn about our election, which is kind of a loaded word, or maybe it's become a loaded word in theological conversation. But we learn that we are chosen by God. We learn of our election, our chosenness by God, and that we are made holy through what? Through obedience. And we are cleansed through what? Jesus' blood. And it's by that that we are united by him and in him. Through Christ's atoning work, his finished work upon the cross, we have been forgiven of our sins, and we are now united with him. And through our obedience to him, we are uh, being cleansed in an ongoing fashion, over and over again, being cleansed and made more holy, consecrated. Next, Peter traces the height of God's living room, if you will. Peter traces the height, God's great mercy shown to us in Jesus Christ. Let's look at verses 3 through 5. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Uh, I love this part. I love it. And you can tell if you've been paying attention over the last year, this has been the uh, benediction, the doxology, or forget what we call it, the benediction at the end of every worship gathering this year. We've been reading this passage. I love this passage. Uh, see, here, Peter, he could have gone about uh, analyzing and simply describing the height of God's mercy uh, made powerfully available through Christ and his resurrection. But instead... Peter launches into an anthem. He launches into a poetic anthem of praise to God. I mean, as you read this passage, you should feel those little hairs on the back of your neck stand up. It's like, holy smokes. He is, he, he, he's, he's unfurling this thanksgiving, this, this thankful uh, anthem to Jesus. It's lyrically dripping with thanksgiving for the wonderful gift that has been afforded us in our salvation uh, Peter here revels in new birth. He celebrates the new life that has come to us through Jesus Christ. In the power of Christ's resurrection, we have been born again. What does that mean? In the power of Christ's resurrection, we have been born again. Here again is the risk of being around church too often. You hear words like this, you hear phrases and thoughts like this. It's like, oh yeah, got that. I've tucked that away in my memory banks, yeah. Through the power of Christ's resurrection, we have been born again, raised into new life, transferred from the kingdom of death and darkness into the, king of li the kingdom of light and life because of the Son. Yabba dabba doo. That's great. Born again in the power of Christ's resurrection. Now we live expectantly, hopeful in the priceless inheritance which is waiting for us and which we will soon receive. This points toward that already but not yet reality you run into in theology so often, the nature of salvation. Are you saved through faith in Jesus right now? Absolutely. Is a time coming when you will be fully saved, delivered and redeemed, brought into the full presence of God? Yes, it's, that's that both and, that already but not yet reality that permeates our belief in Jesus. A priceless inheritance is awaiting you, and soon you will receive it. This priceless inheritance is the final and full consummation of salvation. Our life everlasting with God himself, being alive forever and fully in the new creation. Now, Peter's celebration, it spills over into that next verse, into verse 6, as he says, So be truly glad. Let's look at verses 6 through 9. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. You know, record scratch to us. God's like, whoa, no, no, no. I thought you said there's wonderful joy ahead. You were saying all these nice things, and now you said trials, struggle, suffering. 
So be truly glad there's wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the what? The salvation of your souls. Because we have been chosen, sanctified, saved, and given an inheritance, we should be truly glad. We should, of all people, be uh, truly glad. People that are defined and motivated by gladness. Recollecting, meditating upon all which that Jesus has afforded us through his life, death, and resurrection, we should be most truly glad because of the wonderful joy that is ahead for us in Jesus Christ. Now, however, we find Peter takes an unexpected turn. We find that Peter takes an unexpected turn to explain the depth, the depth of God's living room, uh, the common experience that we all have in that space. Peter's first re readers were living in tough times. We've talked about this in the past couple weeks. They were living in times of persecution and suffering at the hands of Rome, particularly at the hands of the emperor, the emperor named Nero. Nero was actively pursuing, abusing, and killing many of the Christian brothers and sisters. So Peter says, there is wonderful joy ahead, although you must endure many trials. Does this passage sound familiar? Have you heard something like this elsewhere in scripture? Hey, there's wonderful joy ahead. Although you must endure trials, you must suffer. What comes to mind for you? James? Okay, let's look at James chapter one. You can flip right next door because it's the book right before. <laughs> it's the letter right before first Peter actually. Let's look at James chapter one, verses two through four and then verse 12. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. <clears throat> That's not me. I mean, I struggle with that, right? Does anyone else? It's like, man, when things get really tough, when things go really bad, when everyone's badgering you and hating on you, celebrate. That doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes, but here Peter says it. James says it, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. He's not saying pretend or put on a fake smiley face. See it as opportunity, an opportunity. For you know that when your faith is tested, something happens. Your endurance has a chance to grow, right? You see, he's saying opportunity and chance. What we do with it matters, right? Do we take the opportunity? We seize that chance we've been given. Does our faith grow? So let it grow. Oh, let's see. That's one, uh, two and three. Dear brothers and sisters, when... Yeah, verse four. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. There's a promise. Do these things. Seize the opportunity. And what happens? Your, your faith matures. Your endurance grows. And ultimately, you become perfect and complete, needing nothing. Verse 12. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Consider it an opportunity for joy. Very early on, there was an understanding among, among Jesus' disciples that our salvation and our inheritance will often lead us through difficulty and troubles. They seem to go hand in hand. If you follow me faithfully, you will encounter hardship. You will go through trials. You will have troubles and difficulty. But we must hold on to God's promise. God's promise to sustain us, to protect us through our faith. It has long been accepted by Christ's followers. Yes, suffering will come. Yet through it, you will not be destroyed. If you hold fast, if you press into your faith, if you do not give up, uh, it will not destroy you, but instead you will grow mature, you will be refined, and ultimately the quality of your faith will shine all the more brightly in the world. As in the early church, our faithfulness, yours and mine, our faithfulness in the face of suffering bears powerful witness 
powerful witness of Christ's love and the transforming, transforming power of the gospel to a watching world. Do we suffer well? Do we have joy and gladness in the midst of hardship and troubles? That, for millennia now, has been one of the most crystal clear messages of the gospel to the world. The most powerful witness a Christian can bear. How do we suffer well? So one thing, one last thing I'd like to note, and this is where I'd like to end. Uh, pivot a little bit from Apostle Peter to the Apostle Paul. Because oftentimes what we see uh, Peter expressing resonates and parallels also, not just with James, but with Paul. And I think this is important as we look at the canon of Scripture. All these things are signposts. All these letters are signposts. And they should be pointing us in the same direction, right? So let's pivot to Paul. One last thing to note. Apostle Paul also understood the dimensions of the with God life. The width, the height, and the depth of this welcoming space that we reside in through faith in Jesus. Paul, in explaining God's mysterious salvation plan in Jesus and his calling to share it with the Gentiles, he movingly traces out the size and shape of God's living room, his presence, and his love for us. Uh, turn in your Bible or on your phone, but there's a Bible right in front of you, but you can look at Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, we're going to finish up with a fairly extended passage here, but Ephesians 3, 6 through 21. Here we read a famous passage that describes very eloquently how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is God's love for us. Ephesians 3, 6 through 21. The Apostle Paul writes, and this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, has kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now boldly and confidently come into God's presence. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you, so you should feel honored. Verse 14, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now, all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. There's so much goodness in that passage. One of my favorites. In fact, here's a little bit of a peek into 2023. That's going to be our closing doxology and benediction for next year. So come back in 2023. Jump in on that. But there's so much goodness here, but sadly we're out of time for the day. This is another day, another passage we can jump into, but meditate upon this. Listen to what Paul is saying, the truth he's revealing about God, about Christ, and the work of the Holy Spirit. Meditate on it all week. Perhaps make this, uh, Ephesians 3, 6 through 21, your focus passage for the next seven days. I would love for us to dwell upon this, to try do our best to hide this word in our heart. How good would it to be, be to be able to draw on this truth in our difficult times, in our dark times, in those times when God feels far away, we can return to this say, we've been welcomed into God's living room. Through Christ, we've been welcomed into this intimate space with our maker. God's plan is this, that all people 
will come into his family through faith in Jesus Christ. All people are welcome through faith in Jesus Christ. As Jesus' people, as the church, we display God's wisdom and God's plan to the world, and sometimes that will indeed, according to James, Peter, and Paul, sometimes that will indeed be through suffering, and it will indeed be through hardship. But in the midst of it all, we must not lose hope. Why? Because God has promised to be with us. God has promised to uphold us, to sustain us, and to see us through. So don't give up. So dwell in God's presence. Put down deep roots of faith into his love and his strength. Settle in. Get comfortable in his living room. Be unshakable. Spend your days growing to understand more and more how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is God's love for us which has been beautifully, transformingly, and eternally expressed to us in Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for the encouragement we find in this strange, mature understanding that has been given to us. That yes, there's great treasure, there's great riches to be found in our faith in Jesus. There's great comfort and joy promised to us. But it all plays out. It's all communicated against this backdrop of darkness and suffering in the world. God, I pray that uh, for each of us, we would pursue and start to experience a deeper understanding of the faith, a mature understanding of the faith that leads us into the place of saying, I know that in this life, there will be struggle, that trials will come, oftentimes specifically because of my fidelity to Jesus. But when they come, May I not grow bitter or angry. May I not lose hope, but may I consider them great joy. May I understand that they are, may I understand that they are uh, validating, verifying, confirming the truth of what Jesus has told us through his apostles. That our very faith and our growing faith leads us into difficulty, leads us toward persecution and trial, just like it did for Jesus himself. So not only are we identified with him through our own sufferings, but in that our strength, our, our, our faith grows strong. We become perfect and lacking nothing in our faith. So God, even though it's hard for us to ask for pain and suffering, it's difficult to genuinely ask for hardship and struggles. God, when they come, I pray that we would value them rightly that we would look to you, that we would understand that even though temporally in this life, in this body, it may be uncomfortable, it may be hard, but all the while, we're truly at rest, we're truly welcome, we're truly at home in your presence, and no one, no thing can take that away from us because of Jesus. We thank you that we're chosen. Thank you that we've been washed clean. Thank thank you that... uh, Through our obedience, we're being made holy. God, may your Holy Spirit be at work in each and every one of us today. Help us to grow. Help us to meditate on your word and to be prepared as we expect that trials will come, that we will suffer. But through it all, we will bear faithful and powerful witness to the world because of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Hey, we're going to just spend a few moments here before we sing again. This is a chance for you to sit with the Lord, interact about these things, talk about these things. Maybe read that Ephesians chapter 3 passage. Read it, hear it, pray it back to God. Think about all we've heard from the Word today, because this is a timely message for each and every one of us. May we all grow strong. May our faith grow deep roots. That's my prayer for you. Jesus at the center Jesus at the center of it all. Beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Let's stand and worship God again. Jesus at the center.
us to remember that when we get too involved in something else that is worldly and full of lies, Lord. Help us to remember that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And God, there's no way to get around it, Lord. You are the way to God. You are Lord Jesus. And we proclaim that here. God, if that's divisive, then let it be so. Because you are the Lord. And we worship you here, Lord. We thank you for that. God, help us to center ourselves around you. We pray. And uh, thank you so much, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Yeah, you may be seated. I love that song. Just uh, Jesus would be the center. And I, and I think that uh, that's what this is all leading us toward. That Jesus would be the the center of our of our life, of all of our experience. And so as we prepare to scatter from here back into our worlds, back into this frigid week ahead, or into it, <laughs> um, I pray that you would uh, go with the desire to see Jesus become the center. And uh, one thing I was just thinking about is, you know, sometimes what we talk about, like, hey, in the midst of suffering, stay focused on Jesus, uh, hold fast to that great treasure we have in our salvation, and don't be shaken. Um, it's easy to take stuff like that and retroactively condemn ourselves because we've been through hard times and we didn't do that. We didn't hold fast. We don't feel like it matured our faith. We didn't like grow deeper in roots and <laughs> into God's goodness and stuff. We freaked out. We were totally broadsided and, and laying in the ditch. I mean, we're like beat up and left for dead by this. And it's just like, I have a way of piling on saying, well, your track record's been pretty bad. You've not counted it pure joy when many troubles of many colors, is what the word means, comes, came my way and said, I ended up in a fetal position spiritually, whimpering and uh, being completely self-absorbed, you know? And so we think that that past behavior is a predictor of future performance. But the thing is, is our faith in Jesus is very future-oriented, isn't it? It's always looking ahead. There's a psalm or a proverb. I can't remember what. I probably should have looked this up. But it says, a righteous man falls seven times. Well, what's the second part? But he gets back up. Listen to what that's saying. A righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. He gets back at it. He looks toward the next opportunity to grow and to shine brightly. Um, what defines a righteous man, a righteous person in that passage? My thinking is that, oh, they didn't fall. A righteous person doesn't fall. No, this passage says, no, a righteous person may fall seven times, which is a, a, a picture of completion, right? The num numbers seven means completion. Falls all the time. But he never stays down. He never wallows in self-pity. He never gives uh, all the power and control to the failure he trusts over and over again in Jesus and he gets back up he trusts in God and he gets back up and he goes to meet the next opportunity to get it right this isn't even written down guys <laughs> what may you go with that look to the next opportunity to count it pure joy to dig into that deep treasure that inheritance we have through our faith in Jesus that we would grow strong and mature perfect and lacking nothing as we follow Jesus. You may fall seven times this week, but may each and every time you fall, may you get back up through faith in Jesus. Blah. As we await the miracle of Bethlehem, let us offer our prayers and hope to the Lord who comes, that we may accept the Father's invitation to live in Christ, just as Mary accepted God's call to be the mother of the Messiah. We pray to the Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord that we may respond in loving concern for those in need, as did Elizabeth in her care of Mary, we pray to the Lord. Yeah. Hear our prayer, O Lord. That our joy may be to serve the Lord by serving one another, we pray to the Lord. Yeah. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Jesus the Messiah revealed to us the love of the Father, and so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Father of light, you have fulfilled your promise of old. The Virgin has given birth to your Son, Emmanuel. As he shared our life in the world, 
may we share his life in your kingdom to come. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, Emmanuel. Amen. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.